Hey everybody, and welcome to worship today at Word of Life. I'm Pastor Schoen. Wanna thank you for joining us today. Really hope you enjoy our worship time. We get a chance to sing some great songs and think about the role of our Heavenly Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in our lives. We hope and pray that the message today and the songs that we sing and other elements of our service speak to you and encourage you for your daily life. If there's anything that you need, if there's any prayers that we can pray on your behalf, anything we can answer about who we are here at Word of Life or more information about who we are, you're welcome to contact us here at 630-355-355. 9655. You're also welcome to check out our website at wordoflife.net to find out more about who we are and some of the upcoming events that we have. May God bless your time of worship.
The reading from today is Romans chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring.
Welcome back and thank you for worshiping with us today. Would you pray with me, please? Dear Jesus, we thank you for the great opportunities that your spirit provides for us in leading us boldly every day. So Lord God, Heavenly Father, as we think today on the power of being led by the spirit, reveal to us great opportunities that you have as we seek the greater things of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you remember the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about the power and opportunity we have in being led by the Spirit. We seek to connect God to our daily lives. And we talked in week one, a couple of weeks ago, about what it meant to act like a child of God. And the main topic of what we said was that sometimes we can act like a child. And if we act like a child, we're going to see results of that. But if we act like a child of God, we're going to see great things that God has for us and is working and doing through us. And so we're going to seek to be children of God, not just children. And last week we talked about the way in which sometimes we fall back into a place of fear or sometimes complacency. If there's something ahead of us that we're unsure about or things that are happening, sometimes we default to a place that we shouldn't be just because it's comfortable, but not because it's good. And how if we're led by the Spirit, then we can have greater sense of faith and trust in moving forward and not always trying to fall back to something that we feel is comfortable. And today we're going to talk about the opportunities that the Spirit has in showing us our relationship before our Heavenly Father Himself. And I'm going to start with this illustration that starts with the phrase carpe diem. And many of you have probably used the phrase carpe diem at some point in time in your life. Some people have mistranslated it as seize the carp when it's really seize the day. And we've seen that a lot of young people nowadays are misunderstanding the phrase seize the day, and they're kind of using it interchangeably with the phrase YOLO, which is another phrase I'm not cool enough to use, but it means you only live once. And so they attribute seize the day as the same idea of you only live once, that I'm not sure if tomorrow's even going to happen, so I'm going to seize the day. I'm going to seize every opportunity and do whatever I want today. But if we understand the original intent or meaning of seize the day, that's not at all what it was originally intended to mean. The whole phrase seize the day once upon a time was seize the day and trust the future as little as possible. And what that means is that we should be seizing the day. We should be taking the opportunities that we have today in order to prepare or plan for the future because we don't know what the future is going to hold. The future is uncertain. And it's not necessarily about just doing whatever we want today because tomorrow may not be there, but it's a phrase that's meant to encourage and inspire us to plan and prepare because we don't know how the rest of our lives or even tomorrow is going to play out. And so we're going to be thinking about that phrase, seize the day. But more importantly, what does it mean to seize an opportunity or seize something? Our text today is going to build upon that. And the phrase that we're going to use as our main point is, seize the Spirit like Jesus. Seize the Spirit like Jesus. And let me explain, because I could use a lot of different words there for seize. I could say, use the Spirit, or uh, embrace the Spirit like Jesus. But when we think about the power of the Spirit, as we're going to see in our text from Romans chapter 8, I believe the intent of what the writer, St. Paul, is talking about, if we think about Jesus and the role and the relationship that Jesus had with the Holy Spirit, It's a role in a relationship that isn't just simply about embracing or using the Holy Spirit or cultivating the Holy Spirit or utilizing the Holy Spirit, but it's an offensive type of word. It's an offensive type of ideology. We want to seize the power of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is going to give us great things if we allow ourselves to be led by God through his Holy Spirit into today tomorrow, and beyond. So I'm going to start, and I'm going to read our entire text today, and then we're going to go back and we're going to look at it and think about what that means for you and me. And so here is the text from Romans chapter 8. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. 
The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. So let's go back and look at that piece by piece. So we're going to start with that opening phrase, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. If you remember last week, the beginning part of that is you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. And so if we connect what we have here with that, it says you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So God doesn't want us to have the spirit of fear that we're somehow disconnected from our heavenly Father, that we're somehow disconnected from God, that he has somehow separated himself from us only to be able to be restored by the things that we do. We instead are going to see that God's spirit is going to connect us. Not our works, not all of the things we run around trying to do, trying to please God and say, Lord, just save me if I'll do this one last thing for you. Uh Uh-uh. It starts with God, and he gives us grace and opportunity through his love and mercy. When it says we have received the spirit of adoption as sons, you might be tempted to say the spirit of adoption and then as sons. But what we want to understand is when we look back at the Greek and it says the spirit of adoption is sons, that phrase adoption is sons is one word in the original language. And so it's one whole context or it's one whole concept of the idea is uh, son placing. That we are being placed in a relationship as a son of God. And that goes back to the beginning For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. That was a couple of weeks ago. And so the Spirit himself, the Holy Spirit, gives us this opportunity or this relationship, this idea that we, by the Spirit, are being placed into the family of God. And it's interesting. When it says here, by whom we cry, Abba, Father, I went back and I looked at the Greek. I looked at the original language, and that phrase, by whom, in the Greek actually says, in which. And I was kind of interested, I, why did they translate it that way? It would have been better if they had let it, left it as in which. Because, listen to how it sounds now. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, in which we cry, Abba, Father. Not by whom, but in which we cry. By whom makes me think that we might cry, Abba, Father. Or there's a possibility that if we think rightly, we might. But I want to challenge you into thinking this way. That if we have the Spirit as adoption of sons, if we have the Spirit upon us, it's not a matter of we might cry, Abba, Father. We might go to God with a thanksgiving prayer and a sense of intimacy in who He is. But it's a certainty If we have the spirit of adoption as sons, we will cry, Abba, Father. We will give a thanksgiving praise. We will understand that we have this intimate relationship. It's not an if type of idea. It's an absolutely, it is certain type of idea. And so that's a powerful way to start what Paul is talking about here. And so we want to believe or we want to know with certainty that God has brought us into this relationship. It's not anything that we have started or we have initiated. God's spirit has brought us to this place. And that's a great thing. That's a wonderful thing. And 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 it continues. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ. So the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. There is this cooperative relationship between the Spirit and us and kind of the essence of who we are. And so the understanding is here, here is that when we hear what the Spirit is saying, when we listen to the power of the Spirit and the confirmation that the Spirit gives to us that we are a part of God's family, then we will know that we are children of God. And that's what God wants us to know. That's what God wants us to understand. 
that we are his children, that we have this relationship brought about by him. And it's going to mean something powerful for us as we move forward. And if children then, heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ. On the screen, I'm going to put up a picture of a grandmother and a grandchild. And if we think about the relationship that we have with our grandparents, a lot of us have very positive memories with our grandparents. But I think there's a relationship sometimes that we take for granted. In when our grandparents come over, if you think back to when you were younger, was there a lot of times when your grandparents came over and you just assumed that they were going to bring something, bring a gift or give you something? Maybe it'd be money or that they were going to give you this or that, that there was always going to be some type of present that came with your grandparents, especially if you live far away from your grandparents and you only saw them periodically. I know in my life, when I was younger, there a lot of times was that expectation. And, and I think if we look here, we get a chance to understand that sometimes we take this relationship with God for granted, that we are heirs with Christ, that we are going to get something. But God doesn't want us to think that way. I remember when Mary and I first got married, and Mary's parents had a dog, Lexi, and Lexi was this big dog. She was a boxer bulldog mix, and so she weighed like 80 pounds. I mean, it's a huge dog. And I've never really been much of a dog person, so I really have never been around dogs in the house. I've always grown up with cats in the house. And so when we first got married, I was wondering exactly what I needed to do in order to um, kind of make Lexi kind of like me. And so every time we would go over to Mary's parents' house, I would always stop at the store. We would always stop at the store, and I'd buy a bag of doggy treats. And so we'd go over, and I would give Lexi all these doggy treats, and whatever was left, I'd give to Mary's parents. Say, you can give them to Lexi kind of however you want. But it was kind of this routine every time we went over there that I would get these dog treats and give them to Lexi. It came to the point where Lexi knew we were coming and she could see or sense that we were outside and she knew that if we were there or if I was there, dog treats were coming. And so she'd always be waiting by the door and she would always be kind of around me the whole time I was there. Mary used to get really frustrated at me because I was buying Lexi's affection and kind of stealing her away from the rest of the family because Lexi always wanted to hang out with me thinking she was going to get some dog treats. And I think sometimes we have that relationship with God. We stick around to God, or some people maybe stick around to God because they think that they're going to get something. It's kind of this uh, grandson or grandchild, grandparent relationship that there is going to be this inheritance that gets passed on to us. But that's not the point of what St. Paul wants us to understand. If we are children of God, we get an opportunity, as the text says, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. If we're in a relationship of sonship and adoption with God, we get an opportunity to stand next to Jesus and not always in submission to him. We have to understand that there is a time because of the way that the Bible talks about the relationship between God's Holy Spirit and us that we're in the same place as our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that's a powerful thing because what we want to think about and we want to understand that it is by the Spirit that we have this relationship and we have the same type of relationship with our Heavenly Father that our earthly Lord and Savior had and it was through the work of the Holy Spirit or through the gift of the Holy Spirit. Here's what I want you to think about. When Jesus was born into this world and imagine me having a soapbox and standing up on the soapbox now. Jesus, when he came into this world and was born as a human being like you and me, he had his divinity with him, but there was a lot of times that he didn't utilize his divinity. 
And, and I think as Lutherans, a lot of times we really struggle with how to deal with the humanity of Jesus because we don't want to be sacrilegious when we talk about the divinity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And a lot of times we as Lutherans, we will default strictly to the divinity of Christ doing everything. But we understand, or we should understand from Scripture, especially all those times that Jesus talks about the power of the Spirit upon him, all of the Old Testament prophecies saying that the Spirit of the Lord was going to be on the Messiah, guiding the Messiah, leading the Messiah, giving the Messiah opportunities to do great things. Why would we expect that when Jesus, if he was the Messiah born into this world, that the Old Testament prophecies would not be fulfilled in that way? Especially if we use them every year around Christmas time and talk about Jesus in that way. But there's always some times where we step back a little bit, and it's not just us as Lutherans, but us as Christians, where we think a lot of times that it's always the divinity of Christ that did these things, as opposed to Jesus allowing himself to be used or led through the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I think sometimes we just have a hard time rationalizing that. And so we default to stepping back when we talk about the nature of the Holy Spirit and Jesus' humanity. If we as Christians confess in the creeds that we believe the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are co-equal, then why can't we talk about that in, the regard, in regard to the Holy Spirit and Jesus and the Father, especially the earthly Jesus? If we believe that the Spirit, Jesus, and the Father are all co-equal, then why should we have a problem elevating the role, the gift, and the power of the Holy Spirit not just in the life of Jesus, but also in our lives as well. I believe Jesus, and I think it's exemplified on his baptism, when the Holy Spirit came down upon him, and the Father said, this is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Now we don't, when we are baptized, have the voice of God coming out of the cloud saying, that is my son in whom I am pleased. Listen to him. But the effect is the same. If the spirit come down, comes down upon us, and if we believe what St. Paul is saying here about us being co-heirs, getting the same gift of the spirit that Jesus had, then why can't we think in those terms or think that way? And why can't we utilize the gift of the Holy Spirit in our daily lives in the same way that Jesus used the Holy Spirit? Now, we must make a distinction. The divinity of Jesus allowed him to do certain things that obviously we do not have the power to do. We believe that the divinity of Jesus did have its role in the miracles and the healings that he was able to accomplish, staying sinless. But that's not all that the Spirit does. What if Jesus saw the Holy Spirit as more than just this external force upon his ministry? But what if Jesus saw the Holy Spirit as integral to who he was from the very bottom up as a human being here on earth? What if our Lord saw the role of the Holy Spirit as a companion with him, helping him accomplish great things that we see revealed for us in Holy Scripture? Should that not change how we view the Holy Spirit upon our lives and upon the ministries, whatever they might be that we have. Are we willing to believe and are we willing to say that the Holy Spirit is more than just this external entity or this external force that gives us faith and sustains our faith, but that the Holy Spirit is meant to be a companion to us, helping us accomplish great things every single day. That is what St. Paul is talking about here 
when he calls us children as heirs and co-heirs with Christ. What we have received is better than any monetary blessing or any monetary gift that we can receive. It's a lifelong companion that is there to support us, encourage us, lift us up, and help us do greater things. And so I believe Jesus seized the power of the Holy Spirit. He didn't just embrace. He didn't just utilize. He didn't just use the power of the Holy Spirit. But he seized the power of the Holy Spirit, and we see what he was able to accomplish. Are we willing to think about the Holy Spirit being able to help us accomplish great things? Or do we think the role of the Holy Spirit is only good for a couple of things? I want to challenge you as you seek to connect God to your life and your life to God, and you seek to be led by the Spirit, think about the Holy Spirit as a companion. Showing you not just Jesus and the message of grace and the opportunities that Jesus gives to all of us, but what you can do in the name of Jesus. May he help you with that always. In the name of our Lord and Savior, amen. Hey, everybody. Would you pray with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for this opportunity to worship. Heavenly Father, we pray for the Spirit to lead us. We pray that we would think more fully about what it means to have the Spirit as a companion, encouraging us and walking with us every step of the way. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we know that there are many people that need healing in many ways. On our hearts and minds are those that continue to battle the coronavirus. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would intervene and heal them as they need, wherever they might be. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we know that there are other people that need healing apart from the coronavirus. Lord, we think of Janet, elevated liver enzymes and fatigue that she is experiencing. Lord, as the doctors are seeking answers to her condition, Lord, we just pray that you would um, be with them and be with her and her family. Heavenly Father, we continue to pray for Janice as she battles Huntington's, for Pam and the rheumatoid arthritis that she continues to live with. We pray for her brother Scott and all others who are battling cancer at this time, that you would be with them and raise up opportunities that they might be healed. Heavenly Father, we pray for Helen and we pray for Lene and the many ailments that they have. We pray for Phil, that you would continue to heal him. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we pray for people who are preparing for surgery and those that are recovering and healing from surgery. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we continue to pray for those that are experiencing joblessness or um, underemployment at this time, that you would raise up opportunities for them that they might be able to provide for not only themselves but their families as well. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we pray for not just our church but all churches during this difficult time. We pray for the message of the gospel through streaming technologies to reach more and more people they might know the message of Jesus and be saved. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we pray especially for those that are traveling, that you would watch over and keep them safe. We continue to pray for schools at all levels, whether they be um, at the uh, elementary or the middle school, high school or college level, that you would keep teachers and students and other staff people safe. Lord God, Heavenly Father, We just continue to pray for our country with newly elected leaders, that you would help us in the transition process, that you would be with all of our leaders, giving them wisdom and guidance, allowing them to seek after you and your ways, that they would lead with grace and mercy and love. For these prayers and all the other prayers that are on our hearts, Lord, we lift them to you now. In the name of your Son, Jesus, who has taught us all to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition so you will not grow weary and lose heart.
I want to thank you again for worshiping with us today. Hope the message of the gospel was understood and that it gave you encouragement for your day. May God bless your week.